Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here at Clunes. This is Book Week at Clunes, and uh, we're in the uh, Granite Church here, and uh, we're going to show you something of uh, some of the techniques we use in bookbinding. I'm Jim Finger from the Victorian Bookbinders Guild, and uh, shortly you'll see a little bit of a scan around as we uh, look around the, uh, uh, the, the church to the other sellers here and uh, we'll proceed with doing some demonstrations of a couple of little things with regard to uh, uh, the materials and equipment used for bookbinding and then later this afternoon we'll actually do some book construction work. So, you swap to... Uh, ah, and here we are looking around the... Uh, around the, the, uh, the Granite Church which is run, which is uh, occupied by Wesley and uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of other booksellers here and the State Library is over behind us with uh, some very old works showing off the uh, conservation of those old works. And there we go, there's uh, the State Library. The State Library can give a wave if they like. Yeah, that's it. Good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yes, you're, you're on TV. <laughs> okay. So, Tim, if you direct us back here. Well, the very first thing we get asked about bookbinding is what tools, what equipment do you need, what things do you need to be able to do something with, uh, with bookmaking? Well, it all starts off very, very simply. You need a cutting mat because you're going to work with paper and want to be able to cut the paper. When we talk about cutting, of course, you're going to want cutting tools. Scalpel. Scissors, an awl for poking little holes in paper. Sometimes you're going to want a real knife for working with leather, for taking and trimming the leather, sometimes for trimming finely piece of paper. After we have our cutting tools, we need to look at what we do with regard to measuring. Steel ruler, square, and a couple of plastic squares. And they'll certainly get you a long way down the track with, uh, with uh, doing work on books. Of course, this sort of square is an engineer square, and it's very handy when you are cutting a piece of material and you want to be sure that you've cut the material to match and it's square. So cutting and matching is a very important thing. So having a square is a very useful item. Of course, once you get up with books a little bit, we have to sometimes take more action than just pressing and folding, so we actually have to use a hammer. And this has got a rounded face to allow us to be working with a book block if we need to have that book block and actually form the edges of the book block. We use a hammer. From there, the other sharp pointy thing we need is we need a needle because we're going to be stitching and sewing, so we're going to stitch with needles, we're going to sew with thread. Once we get past all of that, we come to the point of putting everything back together. So brushes, a variety of brushes, paste brushes, small brushes, large brushes, all do different parts of glue, but usually most people start off with just two. And uh, two brushes, one a little one for doing fine edges, a larger one for covering air larger areas of material. And then there's another brush which is vitally important. Everybody keeping books should have one of these. Now this is a rabbit hair brush with very soft bristles. Oops. And every time you go to your bookshelf and take a book off, this should be somewhere close so that you can do a little dust on the top of the book and make sure there's no junk in there, especially if the book hasn't been read for a while. You've taken a bit of dust away and uh, now it's not going to go down inside your book when you open it. So, the important brush is to have a little, uh, uh, a, uh, um, a little, a little rabbit hair brush. They're actually shaving brushes, usually on a couple of dollars, but really worth having. We need to be able to cut larger material, like boards. So, if we want to be able to cut thick cardboard, then we can use a pair of shears like this. You can do it the hard way, which is, uh, which is actually, or the precise way, which you sometimes need to do, which is having a knife and multiple little cuts through our, our uh, board to end up with a nice, square, clean result. From there, a couple of weights are always handy because once I've put a book together 
and I'm going to glue the board on there and I'll put some glue around the place. We want to make sure it's going to stick. So we will put our book together, carefully put a weight on it and hold it for it to dry. So it holds it in the right place, but doesn't move around, doesn't wrinkle, comes up with a nice finish. So a few weights, these are just chunks of steel with a, a bit of book cloth wrapped around the outside. Last thing that we use, or not the last thing, but something else that we use regularly and use a lot, is a folder. Now we use a folder because we're going to fold paper in order to do our task. And my sheet of paper has disappeared, so I'll find another sheet. So you've got a sheet of paper, and you have to fold it to a specific size. First thing you're going to do is check the grain of the paper to make sure the grain of the paper is right before we do anything with it. If the grain of the paper is running from head to tail, the sheet has this lovely thing we call drape. And if you have a look, you can see the sheet drapes nicely. If we're going against the grain, when we try to turn this way, the sheet doesn't want to drape, even though this is the wrong piece to be actually showing you that with. Where's the right piece of paper to... had some small pieces here. This is terrible, T terribly disorganised and they haven't got all the things in the right place. Um, if you try to take this sheet of paper and fold it this way, it feels really stiff. It doesn't want to drop over easily. That means that the grain is running the other way. When you use the, 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 the paper like this and you fold it over, you find this paper folds quite easily from the top to the bottom of the book. And that's the first thing you have to learn in any bookbinding class is choose your paper to the task. And always a book needs to have the grain running from the top to the bottom. Now if you've got the grain running the wrong way, first of all, it makes it stiff when you open the book. Second of all, every time you move the page like this, it further weakens the page, particularly if that page has been folded. Right? So if we fold this page, and when you try to fold it, you find it wrinkles and carries on. But when we fold this page like this, and we rub it down, so that we've got a crease in there, and the grain is running across this way, we've effectively broken the grain. Before very long, a few dozen openings, and suddenly this page is going to start getting weak. And I can assure you in 10 years time, you'll have a page falling out. So having the grain of the paper, in all circumstances, running from the top to the bottom is very important. It's also important with our boards as well. You can see it prominently. This is the little bit of board we're going to use in this job later today. And if the grain is the wrong way in the board, which this one happens to be, it's been cut the wrong way, when you fold it, when you try and fold it this way, see how stiff it is? Right now, because the paper is a, that is so stiff, when I actually glue something else on there, it's going to wrinkle like this. It's going to wrinkle up. And so when you put the board on there, you'll end up with a book like in, looking like this. Knowing your materials and having your materials with the right grain is very important for a good book in the end. So, if... That's enough about the, the, uh, the materials and the techniques of uh, the, the equipment that you use. So this is a little book we're going to construct today. We won't get it all done in our time here because it takes more than the hour to get it done. Um, and this is the same basic book we would use in any book class. We have some sections which have been, which have been stitched and sewn together. And so we're going to stitch down, down through there with some linen thread. Um, we're going to stitch it onto a tape so that we can extend this tape out onto our boards. So the securing of this into the book is predominantly through the strength of the book supports, that is the cords or tapes that are across the back here. From there, once we've, uh, well, once we've put it together and stitched up to that amount, um, and we often use a little trick here, you don't have to have a special frame for it. This is an ordinary book pressing board that we'd use. But you can see I've actually taped this onto the edge of the board and taped our backing tape on with uh, frog painting tape. Doesn't leave any residue when you peel it off. We don't use sticky tape. It leaves a residue that we don't want on there. 
This doesn't leave a residue. So find the one that they talk about is, well, a green frog tape, man. It's, uh, it's the one which doesn't leave bits on when you peel it off. All right? So you can mount that like that. You can work away with your needle, threading between the sheets, special little catch stitches to catch it at each end. And this one has been treated one step further. It's not just the block, but now we've actually put on there what we call an end paper. Now you see the end paper goes right across here. Again, the grain is vital on here because if we put that end paper on and the grain's the wrong way, every time you open the book it weakens the grain and it's going to fall off. So we get to that stage, we're ready to design, oh, sorry, we're ready to put some extra reinforcing on the back of the book. Now this is mull, which is just a, um, a thin mesh. The glue goes through it, provides threads going across the back of the book. If we wanted to make the book stronger, we would then look at using one of the other. There's various strengths of this material, depending on how much work the book might do. Um, if it's a library book, a library binding, then we'd go to a very strong cloth across the back there to provide the real strength in the hinges. So they're all steps that we go. We, we uh, nicen up with a little bit of end band here, headbands rather, headband here, just to make it look pretty once we've closed it. And, and uh, we'll glue this up and we're ready to think about putting some boards on. We're going to cut our boards nice and neatly and squarely with the grain running the right way. Look at that. I marked that, I marked that piece of board. The grain is running the right way. Always check your marks because the grain doesn't run the right way on those boards. That's better. And if you want to have a feel of one just to see, you'll see how much difference there is in the board. Now we want to trim our block so that we're going to have a little hinge space. So we, we allow a little space there for hinging and we want it to overlap about three millimetres all the way around our block. Now if I've trimmed this one right, it should be pretty close to the right size. It's a fraction longer than what it should be. So you can see we've left a little hinging gap there and the overlap is just a fraction, a fraction bigger than what it should be. So what I'm going to do now is I will just hand cut this to, uh, to the right length. You can see from the back of these by the way, we're recyclers as well. This was a packet of, um, of uh, paper and it came with a piece of cardboard at either side of the paper and of course they're stingy so they've actually put some in with, a, with the grain the wrong way around. It was all off cut board so it comes with the grain the wrong way around. Now let me just quickly remeasure this. Uh, one of the things you're supposed to be as a book binder is really organised and clean but when you're trying to work really quickly like this uh, 93. So we want to be 93 wide. Oh, I see. We're not 93 wide. Anymore. Okay, so. Ninety-three. Now, when you're using a pencil in the bindery, any idea what sort of pencil you're going to use? Anybody got a guess of what sort of pencil you might use? Well, there's an important little number on the back of here. I don't know if they can pick it up in the overhead. Can you pick that in the overhead? It says 2B. 2B or not 2B? If you use one that's got a H there, uh, have I got a H one? Oh no, I've been conscientious, no H ones. Um, but this one's a 4B. Now booksellers love a 4B. Because it's so soft, if you write with it, then you can grab a rubber and as soon as you rub it, it's gone really easily. You use a HB or a H pencil, you have to push hard enough to leave an impression in the paper. 
don't want to leave impressions in the paper. We're looking at any mark we make on our book, we want to be able to get rid of it afterwards, and we don't want to ha have anything there. This one, yeah, that's, that's a HB as well, a, a, a 2B as well. That's another thing that, that uh, is very, very useful. These days, these uh, Stadler rubbers, you know, the, 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 the synthetic whatever it is stuff that they use, near brilliant at getting rid of little marks and things. And uh, in, in the binding process, you end up having to put little marks on your, on your paper and on your card very regularly. So if you were making a lot of books, you might decide that you're going to have a uh, guillotine and a uh, board cutter, but we're not, so we're uh, just using it by hand. And I'm going to put the two together because I want to make sure that they're both exactly the same size. Okay, I'll check it on my book again to make sure that when I put it on there, it looks like the right amount of overhang on the edge. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I can afford to be just a whisker shorter than that. And I'll just check to make sure this is actually square because it doesn't look to me like it is. No, it's not quite square. So I'm going to take just a little piece off that just to make sure that I've. Uh, Got it completely square. It's a fraction along as well, so I can afford to do it. You notice I'm doing a lot of a lot of small strokes um, on anything thicker than the than the thinnest tissue. Um, you'll use multiple strokes to cut it, um, just to make sure that when you're actually cutting. Um, you're cutting precisely with minimal pressure on it and uh, not going to mess the job up because you've pushed too hard and made it go wrinkly. Okay, so now we've got uh, our book block ready to go and we've got a board for either side with about the right amount of overhang. It's not super critical on a little job like this whether it's two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters of overhang. Um, particularly when you're learning, you don't sweat too much on that precision, right? Um, and we're ready to think about actually putting some cloth on there. Okay, so the next thing from there would be to uh, choose a piece of cloth. We're gonna, oh, and I forgot. It's one little piece for in the spine. So that's going to be our spine reinforcement. And uh, from my previous calculations, this should be 10 millimeters plus plus eight. So that should be 18 millimeters between there and there. I'll call it 20 just in case. So we're going to actually paste that, stick it on there. Now. I do a little cheat here. I rarely actually trim my material completely to size first time up. And I always allow a generous amount of leftover um, so that after I've glued, I can then trim this again to make a, a nice, neat finish. All right, and so what I'm going to do is get me some paper. Excuse me, one moment. So a generous amount of scrap paper and I'm using here EVA glue. So we're going to use EVA and uh, in the perfect world. In a perfect world I wouldn't be using sparkling mineral water. Mix up with the residue of coffee. But seeing as how this is not a perfect world, we're going to get by. 
Um, we don't want our brush to be too dry when we start dip dipping it in the glue. Otherwise, the glue penetrates too far into the brush. Okay, so we'd always have a moistened brush, a little bit of moisture in it, and uh, means it's going to be easier to handle. So we will paste out on our uh, paste out. Right, do that again. There's still a bit much moisture in the brush, but it'll get there. For some uniformity across there. And there's a lovely pre stained board already a light coffee colour. down and paste uh, up my strip in the middle. Now if I was doing a lot of these I'd make up a little jig so that I knew that the book was going to be a certain size um, and I wouldn't have to now do a little measurement here that says this is going to be 21 millimeters apart on the bottom of there before I place the second one. Um, and I would have already done the right thing there. Remember I said to you about the grain of the paper? And can you see what's happened with these couple of boards? Can you see how they've wrinkled? Right? Okay, they've wrinkled that way because the grain is running this way, okay? So when we've done that, we're able to say fairly accurately that we do have our grain the right way. Right? And uh, we've managed to uh, to do that. I'd make a little jig here that would go uh, a little jig here that would go um, the right length for this. The uh, the right gap either side. So I'd have a piece of cardboard cut that was going to give me the right spacing on both sides without having to measure it. Right about now, the ideal would be to grab my pressing boards. If I had a uh, uh, press, I would, I would uh, nip it, but often you can get by with just a weight. And we're going to nip it so that that's glued into place and remains in place. Now I'm going to put uh, 15 millimeters all the way around here. Now I'll make it 12 millimetres all the way around here and we're going to trim off our surplus cloth. Did you see that happen? Only after I did. Right. I'm hoping that didn't get on the camera, Tim. Sorry? There's a reason why you try not to have a crowded bench because that way you can't knock things over accidentally. And uh, and of course the drawback with all doing all of this is we're trying to do it in a real rush instead of putting it aside, you know, uh, um, not 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 pouring coffee all over everything. Now we'll just run these surplus bits of uh, of our material off here. And of course, knowing you're on camera and knowing you're in front of the crowd also means you get more nervous more likely to uh, do something wrong.
too fast. And uh, okay. Now, for neatness' sake, we've got a nice even, even width of. Uh, of material overhanging our boards. Plenty of times uh, you'll find books with variable width, particularly if they're handmade. Um, and we'll give a little rub just to make sure we've tightened everything down nicely here. Now the last little measuring tool that we use, put those out of the way now, the last measuring tool we use has disappeared. When you're doing this all the time, you uh, make up a stack of little jigs. They're just a couple of bits of cardboard. You can buy fancy brass ones for $50 a piece, but I still use little board ones. And this one says 2.2 millimeter boards. Well, I know I've only got a 1.5 millimeter board there. It's not exactly the right one, but it gives us, by simply pushing it against the corner, the ability to do a little trim and go, oh look, I've got a nice corner, pretty well the right size to finish off. Okay, so just a matter of using uh, and again not being too anxious, not cutting your jig up but uh, just uh, trimming only the, the material underneath there. You can uh, measure each one you, yourself if you want but um, the effort of making a little jig even for one book makes it really worthwhile doing <laughs> because it does mean you get a better finish. Okay, so we've got to the stage of now doing our turnings. And when we turn in, you can see there's a little overlap on our, uh, on our corner there. Now we're not worried about that. Um, some people would like that to be very, very small. I don't mind it being a little bigger because when it's a little bigger and we, we, we run the corner down and glue it um, and get to roll the other corner up, it's actually a bit thicker on the corner. So it gives a bit extra th thickness to the corner. Some purists might say that they want it, you know, an absolute neat 1945, uh, 45 degree butt and so on. I like the bit extra material in the corner because it means that particularly a notebook or something that you're going to use that gets around the place is going to, uh, to be... Um, um, one of the other things you always do is as soon as you finish gluing, you take the page and throw it in the bin and the glue doesn't go everywhere. Um, so just that, that's one of the, the rules, if you like. So we're simply going to glue up the corners here, run them over. How long before we run out of time, Tim? No answer was a stern reply, but that must be enough. Making sure our glue goes into the corners. Amount of glue is important. You learn how to get the right amount of glue so there's not too much, but not too little either. So that we just end up with a good finish on it. Okay. Now, using our folder here gets to be important because we're going to use our folder to actually generate that little, the little fold as we do it. So we're running up nice and tight against the board. And uh, and uh, I, I actually like to use my fingers a lot more than what I'm supposed to. Whoops, I just forgot this is not my apron. <laughs> My apron's quite uh, messed up, <laughs> so uh, uh, even, the, even the apron's got a history story to go with it. When we were kids we went camping in a tent that my mum and dad bought when I was only uh, a wee tacker. The tent actually turns out to have been pre-World War II. We camped in it all the way up until when I got married. And finally uh, out in the back shed it decided that uh, 
a certain little animal that decided that it preferred living inside the tent, which was stored away, and I didn't know about it. So we ended up having to send the remainder of the tent to the tip. But I kept a few bits, and one of them got turned into a canvas, a canvas um, uh, apron. So uh, waste not, want not is the word. Now I just rolled this corner not in far enough. There's a sort of little trick that you get to when you fold that corner over, just getting it back so it's below 45 degrees. And when it goes back in below 45 degrees, uh, sorry, uh, below being straight on just a little bit of an angle, uh, as it goes in there, it means when you roll it here, it goes back below the top of the board. So these are the sort of techniques that we would show you in the formal class. So that you don't have to pay for it, you just come for nothing. But if you'd like to do the whole day class, just remember that the pamphlets are up there. You can take your pamphlet and book in to do a class. Okay, so now we've put, we've put it together. We just check our corners, come over pretty neatly. And then we should pop that. Apart from that, we're most of the way to uh, having uh, having put our book together. And our book block. It's probably enough for me to actually fold the book block and have a look to make sure that I haven't messed up the sizes, that everything is correct, that we've got just our little three millimeter of overhang 